bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan, and Trillium Health Partners. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Doug Maynard, the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And today we're going to be talking about people with autism spectrum disorder and their families and asking the question, what services do they truly need? Uh, we've got a great presentation with Dr. Jonathan Lai bringing some research about uh, what uh, services children with autism and their families are, are typically accessing and, and trying to match that up with what, they, what they're accessing, what they need, what's available, what's not available, that sort of thing. We've got some great information from him about that. And then we've got uh, Esther Ree from Autism Speaks Canada, um, who's going to be talking about how that how that impacts families in the end. Um, so, uh, and we also have with us on the panel today, um, yeah, um, uh, please uh, welcome back Dr. Gail Andrew, uh, who from the Glen Rose Rehab Hospital in Edmonton, uh, who is our co-host often on these uh, sessions that are uh, for our rehab community. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gail Andrew back to the uh, to the to the panel as well. Uh, she's also with the with our with CAFC's Canadian Network of Child and Youth uh, Rehab uh, with the Knowledge Translation and Research Committee. Um, so uh, let me introduce our presenters. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Lai is a postdoctoral fellow at York University in uh, autism, research, uh, autism services research, along with uh, Dr. Jonathan Weiss, who uh, many of you know from some many of his presentations on autism spectrum disorder that he's done for our uh, CAFC Presents webinar series. Uh, his current uh, research involves identifying health and service needs for individuals with autism, uh, the factors that influence service use, and predictors of changes in service use over time. And as I mentioned, Esther Ree has also joined us uh, from Autism Speaks Canada. She's the National Program Director there. And in her role, uh, she focuses on supporting individuals with autism spectrum disorder and their families across Canada through the organization's mission to increase resources and services, increase autism research, and build awareness and work as a collaborative community. So it's my uh, pleasure to hand the virtual podium over, first, uh, first off, over to Dr. Jonathan Lai. Over to you. So thank you, Doug. Um, I'm uh, really honored to be able to present uh, to the CAPC Presents, when this CAPC Presents webinar series. And um, yeah, today we'll be talking about people with autism spectrum disorder and their families. What services do they truly need? So just to give an outline of uh, what we'll be speaking about, um, first we're going to start exploring the concept of a service need. What is a service need? How do we determine what people need? Uh, we're going to uh, then zoom in onto autism, autism service needs, and um, mainly talking about a survey I've been working on my postdoctoral work with Jonathan Weiss um, on uh, the CASDA National Needs Assessment Survey, and then introducing our, uh, the big study uh, that we, we published this year, looking at priority needs and receipt, what, the, what are the top needs, what are the factors that are related to getting these top needs addressed across the country. And then a second study um, I'll touch on uh, that we're working on patterns of service use in children, looking at navig uh, navigation of families and relating uh, early intervention and unmet service needs in children across Canada. And then Esther is going to come in and talk about some implications of the research uh, we're doing and uh, share some resources with you. So uh, before we start, I just want to have a poll just to know who's in the audience. It's always difficult on these webinars. So um, who's in the audience? Uh, researchers, if you're a clinician, a manager, administrator, community advocate, uh, policymaker, a family member of someone or someone with ASD and themselves. So if you can fill that out for us, that'd be great so we know who we're talking to. Answers came in quite quickly. That's great. And we'll share those results. We can see that 51% uh, are uh, clinicians. 
25% uh, identify themselves as a manager, administrator, or community advocate. 10% are family members of someone or uh, family member of someone or someone with ASD. 8% uh, are researchers, and 6% are policymakers. Okay, thanks, Doug. Um, so yeah, it sounds like we have a, a diverse mix, uh, mostly in the uh, clinician, uh, administrator, uh, manager, community advocate positions, but. Um, we'll tr I'll try to speak to um, everybody and be able to address different parts and um, some of the, you know, these slides will be posted so I might rush through some things that you might find uh, more specifically interesting. Uh, feel free to uh, look at those afterwards. So let's start off by sort of the 10,000 foot view um, and looking at what do people need. How do we determine uh, what people need in our society? Well, uh, in economics, uh, the term that's usually used is effective demand, when you put supply and demand. And uh, one measure of that is willingness to pay. How much are people willing to pay for a certain service, a certain good? However, in the health and social services uh, area that we're involved in, uh, we know, especially in Canada, that the user, the, the patient, the client, might not always be the payer. They're not the actual ones paying for the resources. So that concept, uh, the, the economic concept, while useful, uh, uh, generally may not always apply in our context. So coming back to the question, how do we measure health and social need in order to organize delivery? So this conceptualization of need is the first idea I want to focus on. This uh, comes from uh, Jonathan Bradshaw's work. Um, and there's, there's four ways he conceptualizes need. First, he talks about normative need. So this is need that we, we uh, ascribe to someone based on the existence of a standard or a criterion. For example, um, you would have professional guidelines, um, research uh, guidelines. And here are some examples. So the International Classification of Function for Disability and Health on the left there. Um, is a guideline about function, and if you're below a certain level, um, you would consider this person in need of certain resources. Um, the other one I have on the screen there are fruit juice recommendations, and this came out uh, just recently, um, a new recommendations for infants, uh, children, and toddlers from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So that's the first one, normative need. The second way we think about need is perceived or felt need, and this is defined by what the user reports. Um, examples of how we ascertain this is through interviews or through surveys. Um, for example, here Statistics Canada uh, out of uh, Canadian survey uh, looking at depression and suicide ideation and how many people meet a certain criteria uh, based on what the user reported. Thirdly, there's express needs. So um, did they express uh, a need through taking a certain action, defined by what the action the user takes. And typically we think of this uh, as wait list. Um, so here, just uh, pulled an example from the news. Um, you know, when we look at wait list, we say, okay, we're gonna address the certain need to reduce wait list times. And that's one way we can conceptualize uh, need in our society. And lastly, uh, relative or comparative need. So this is comparing between similar groups, uh, communities, jurisdictions, um, often uh, having database um, and different organizations looking at this. And here are some examples. So in the top example there, it says Canadians wait longer to see a doctor than the international average. So looking at wait times, but, but not just how long the wait time is, but comparing to other countries. Second example there, same thing in child health, um, how Canada is doing compared to other countries. And the last one there, if you look at this, uh, well, the headline reads, uh, help, huge gap between mental health needs and funding, experts says after the health deal fails. And the, sub uh, the subtitles there says, if this was something like hip and knees, people would be picketing the streets. So comparing between different groups. So here to the comparison between people with health, mental health needs, and come people who need hip and knee replacement surgery, for example. So those are the four uh, ways that we can, we can conceptualize need, normative, perceived, felt, expressed need, or comparative need. Um, so in your area, just to get to know you a little more, um, what are the primary ways that you measure need in, in your day-to-day -day work? So normative, uh, through guidelines perceived, uh, need through what the user reports, express needs through what the user is, uh, the action that they're taking, and relative need by contrasting similar groups. All right, we'll close that off. And it looks like the primary way, at 43% of the audience saying perceived need defined by what the user reports, uh, then followed by, at 31%, by expressed need defined by action the user takes, uh, then 
normative need through a specific standard cri or criterion at 19%, and then only 6% said relative need by contrasting similar groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Doug. Yeah, so it seems like we're, you know, most of us do look at the perceived need as, as our primary way of measuring need, especially looking at wait times and more of sort of a systems perspective, uh, typically. Um, so I'm going to go through these and look at the strengths and disadvantages of, of each of them and um, what, what that shows us, what that allows us to see um, really quickly. So normatively, so first we talked about it's being defined as an ex by an existence of a certain standard. Um, usually this is very objective. Uh, it's, it's in terms of really data-driven uh, by what we know. Um, however, so there's possible conflicts that could happen if you have different guidelines, different standards, uh, which we know happens, and also changes that happen over time as, as uh, knowledge base or research changes and as values change in our society. When we look at perceived need, uh, this is defined by what the user reports. Um, the values behind this are, you know, it, it reflects uh, sort of a democratic user autonomy, patient-centered approach. Um, it also allows for a very specific response because the user will tell us exactly what they what they perceive to need. Um, this could be limited, however, by the user's perception. Uh, perception, it can be inflated, or it also can be diminished. Um, diminished, for example, would be, um, say, an elderly uh, person uh, trying to understand what they need when they have a sort of, uh, um, sort of a dementia or uh, other issues later in life. We looked at express need, so this is defined by what the user takes. Um, this is typically quite easily measured. You, you look at the wait list, you see how many people are in line for something. Um, it allows for a quick response. Um, however, this assumes that the user seeks appropriate help, so they're actually in the right line when they're waiting in line, and that we're also measuring the right lines, so measuring what counts. And lastly, relative need. So this is a comparison between groups or jurisdictions. Um, this is concerned with equity between groups uh, in society. And the challenge uh, here is to define what um, what's eligible for being a similar group. How you know how can we make this comparison and is it fair? So um, each of these has uh, its strengths, um, its values, and its its weaknesses, its drawbacks. And it's it's just good. I think as we start to talk about uh, service needs in any population, it's good to kind of keep this in mind. Um, of the values and the advantages of each of these. So now going to autism, so um, uh, specifically, so we see that um, in each of these cases, there is a high level of need that's been illustrated for people with autism. Um, first, in terms of not no normative need, we know there's guidelines um, with uh, different recommendations in the population. Uh, and also what drives a lot of this need is actually the heterogeneity in the population of uh, how we diagnose autism and um, how autism um, diagnoses are being used, not just for uh, medical or, uh, reasons or for uh, intervention reasons, but also for social reasons and to uh, obtain services. So um, it's been used for different things. And uh, here are some just recent examples. I'm um, just highlighting that, you know, there's many different guidelines for how do we diagnose autism spectrum disorder. And there's, there's some variation there um, in the recent review. And on the right side, I'm just highlighting there's a heterogeneity uh, in autism and how do we sort that out. In terms of perceived need, uh, we can look at unmet service needs. So how many uh, service, how many needs you have, and how many you feel have been met by services and caregiver burden. So these, um, from different, uh, these are just two Canadian studies uh, recently talking about how uh, predictors or uh, mapping out what children with autism spectrum disorder um, have needed based on caregiver report. Um, uh, express needs. So a wait list. For autism, um, these are in the news almost every few weeks. Um, the wait lists uh, are, are growing, and in, in that second article in Quebec, I'm calling them appalling. And then uh, relative needs. So uh, compared to other disabilities of similar age, what do people see? Um, they've looked, uh, say, the study on the right there, looking at the National Survey of Children's Health in the, state, in the states, uh, special uh, with all children with special needs. Uh, what do people and people compare? Uh, uh, children with autism versus those without, and seeing differences there. Um, and uh, focusing on going back to that first point I brought up about normative need, the challenge uh, with autism is that it's such a heterogeneous uh, condition, and it's a lifelong condition. And based on the context of where the, the person is, and based on their unique challenges, we do have uh, this issue of meeting their specific needs. So the challenge of uh, chronogeneity, if I can put it in um, a borrowing a term uh, from our colleague at McMaster, Salios uh, Georgiadis, um, chronogeneity over time, chronogeneity. Um, it's a lifelong condition, as I say, and um, there's varying 
levels of concurrent challenges, both in terms of clinical needs. So if you think about physical health, concurrent uh, uh, physical conditions, diagnoses, concurrent mental health uh, conditions, behavioral challenges and adaptive challenges, uh, be it school or at work or transitioning from school into adulthood. Um, so different adaptive challenges. And it's a challenge for individuals and families to navigate and access supports uh, for all these needs so for each individual. Um, and part of the challenge is it's for multiple service sectors. So you're going from health to education to social services, uh, community supports, things like that. So the gap here is to really try to see how do we inform uh, policy and find uh, how, how services can uh, allocate resources more effectively. So to inform system level policy change and resource allocation, um, it is crucial to identify throughout the lifespan perceived service needs to start off. What do people say they need? Um, look at uh, service use patterns currently to date and also correlates of service use. So that's the study I'm gonna focus on. Um, the work uh, comes from this report that has the National Needs Assessment Survey. Um, it was submitted to the Public Agency of Health uh, in August 2014, um, and the website uh, is there, and the full report is, is public, so you, you can uh, take a look at that. And um, the talk's not over, but I want to give the acknowledgments up front. Um, just for the, the families and individuals who participated in the survey, it was quite an extensive survey, um, and for the team that uh, did it, the Autism Spectrum Alliance Disorder, um, Autism, yeah, Canadian Autism Spectrum uh, Disorder Alliance, uh, Mark Whaling, Cynthia Carroll, uh, Dr. Yuna Lenski, and Dr. Carly McMorris, who did that. Um, the help from the Public Health Agency of Canada, who uh, distributed the survey, and my supervisor um, and the chair that he was uh, funded uh, with, um, Dr. Jonathan Weiss, and uh, his mentorship throughout uh, my postdoctoral work to allow for uh, the, this type of research to continue. So in the survey, uh, we we asked, uh, it was an online survey for caregivers, self-advocates, and professionals. Um, we asked um, all individuals in the survey had to be, had to receive an official diagnosis of ASD. Uh, there were about 6,000 or so respondents for the survey. Um, and today I'm gonna focus on the caregiver report. So this is gonna be about 3,200 caregivers that were reporting on 3,300 individuals. So um, the difference numbers is, was uh, usually due to uh, having more than one individual with ASD in their family. So the study I'm gonna focus on uh, is published and it's open access. So um, I will kind of do a high level overview uh, of the results, but if you want more details, uh, feel free to uh, look up the study. Um, so why we did the study. So first we, as I mentioned earlier, so throughout the lifespan, uh, based on the unique profile and challenges in their environment, there are age specific service needs. And secondly, in a user-centered care context, it's important to tailor services to address an individual's unique needs. And lastly, um, the money bag, it can be small, it can be big, but it's still in a bag, so it's still limited. So with limited resources, it's critical to have a user-defined prioritization of service provision. So what do people really want? So our question is, what are the priority needs? What do they really want? Um, what are the, what's the pattern of priority service receipts? So are you getting what you really want? And thirdly, what are the correlates of accessing those priority services across the lifespan for individuals with ASD in Canada today? So what we did, we split off our sample of uh, 3,000 into five groups based on age. So uh, looking at preschools, four and under, elementary school age from five to 11 years old, adolescents from 12 to 17, young adults 18 to 24, and adults from 25 plus. And those are the numbers we have um, broken down into the samples in this survey. And we asked the question, uh, one of the questions we asked was uh, the current service receipt. And the question was, you know, please select any supports or services that the child is currently or recently received, so in the last six months. And we had, there was a list of 23 services and another uh, the text box that was recoded. And we can kind of group them into different uh, groups. So here I just put it into behavioral, developmental, or general services. And this was a comprehensive list that was uh, put together by uh, focus groups and parents and community advocates. 
So with that, we also asked about the top five services. So what are the top five services you currently want for the child? So the same list of services um, that were given and they would check off the top five services they currently want. So first we gave them, we asked about the services that are, they are currently getting, current service receipts. And we asked about the top five services, what they currently want, their priority service needs. And out of that, we can have an individualized priority service utilization score. So out of the five top services, how many are you currently getting out of those top five services from zero to five? And with that, um, the analysis, we did some bivariate analysis uh, with the different sociodemographic, clinical, and systemic factors to see what related at the bivariate level. Um, those that were correlated uh, uh, statistically discernibly, we uh, selected those variables to uh, place as predictors in different regressions by age group. And I'll go through that. So here are the lists of services on the left there um, that were that were um, part of this. So which services are a priority need? And on the top, uh, across the top, you'll see the different age groups divided. And um, you don't have to focus on the details, uh, but we'll say what I highlighted here are the percentages so that of people that endorse a certain need uh, as a priority need. So say social skills program at the very top, 61.3% of the zero to four age group, the preschool age group, 61.3% of parents endorse that as a top priority need. So across social skills program, um, it was about 50% of all, all the age groups um, endorse that as a top priority need. Uh, uh, in contrast that to the uh, third line there that's highlighted, the early intensive behavioral intervention, uh, most, 72% so of the preschool group endorsed that as a top need, and by the time you hit 18, uh, that wasn't considered a top priority need anymore. So um, here in the dark gray, I've highlighted um, the numbers that were above 50%. So more than half of that group endorsed that as a top five need. In the light gray, the shaded light gray, is are the are the percentages that were between 25 and 49 percent. So those are sort of moderate priority needs, and the rest of them um, are just in regular text. So what I want you to focus on is not the numbers, but specifically looking at the distribution of, of the shaded areas. So uh, there's many, there are more high priority areas that were in agreement in the younger groups than the older groups, and in the older groups there were more. Uh, uh, more diversification of needs. So to show this in another way, um, and this is asking the question, uh, what is the pattern of priority needs across the lifespan? So showing this another way, um, same data, looking at the top five needs, um, we see that there was a high agreement in the four to uh, zero to four age group. There are five that were uh, over 50% of that population uh, that sample uh, endorsed. And there were two that were considered moderate needs. And that decreased um, as, as uh, the age cohorts got older um, compared to uh, the moderate needs. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that priority needs first, they vary across the lifespan. So um, certain needs uh, were consistent, say with social skills, uh, activity based, those were relatively consistent over time, but some needs changed over time, which, which is obvious. To some of us, and then we also see that there's a diversification of priority needs across the lifespan. There were more light gray, and there were more um, boxes that were considered priority needs that, um, uh, as uh, individuals were old, uh, for the older individuals. And thirdly, this suggests that there's a need for individualized service planning, especially in um, in the eight, the teenage and adult years, um, and these would involve multiple uh, service sectors. Um, so it really highlights a gap there. So the second question is, how many, so those are priority needs, how many, the second question is, how many are getting their priority needs met? Do you actually receive services that address these priority needs? So in this graph at the bottom, you're seeing uh, how many, the number of priority needs that were met. So there are five priority needs they can indicate, and how many receipts out of the five are you actually getting? So this is the percentage of individuals overall. So uh, here we see 30% say they had zero of five of their top priority needs, uh, which is surprising, especially since they are getting other receipts, other other services at the same time. And only um, 1.7 had five of five of the, uh, five out of five of their priority needs met. Um, so here, so 30.6% 30, had none of their priority needs met. Um, if you look at how many had half, at least half their priority needs met, uh, we hit about 21%, and only 8% had four or five of their top five met. 
The next question is, what is the pattern of priority receipts? So across different ages, um, do people get more or less uh, depending on age group? So in this graph, what we're looking at is the different age groups on the bottom. And this is the average number uh, per individual of how many of the priority needs you have uh, that you receive. So here at the four and under, we, you get the most priority needs met. So I think it's about 1.2. And that decreased when you hit uh, the elementary school age group, where you had a, a less uh, priority needs uh, received on average. And that decreased once you hit the teenage and older years. Yeah, so the youngest group had most priority receipts, uh, 1.9. Uh, that decreased across the lifespan. The older groups uh, received less services that address their top needs. So the following question is, you know, what predicted getting your needs met? So what predicted having a higher priority needs score? So we can look at socio-demographic characteristics, and here are some of the ones we, uh, we analyzed and listed. Um, whoops. And then clinical need factors, um, so some clinical concerns that we can look at. So health status, intellectual disability, current number of behavioral concerns, current number of mental health diagnoses, current number of physical health diagnoses, and also systemic factors. So this is looking at service affordability, uh, if they ever receive government funding, how many services the caregiver actually received. Um, so for example, training, support, counseling, respite, um, how many barriers they saw um, to obtaining services, and um, the number of other services you get. So three different groups of different characteristics, different factors we can look at that are related to having your top needs being met. So um, I'm going to put this in a table and it's going to be looking at the likelihood of getting a certain priority receipt. So what factor relates to getting the likelihood of getting uh, one more priority receipt and the percent change? So looking at so, uh, socio-demographic factors, so here at the top we have our five age groups. So uh, preschool to adults. Um, and here, uh, first we have education. So uh, how you read this is, if they, if the parents had uh, more than a college level diploma, so university or graduate or professional degree, there it was uh, it ranged from 26 to 44 percent chance more likelihood of getting one more priority receipt. Um, if they were living in a suburban or an urban area compared to a rural or remote area, um, it increased their chance of getting a priority receipt uh, by 13 to 14 percent. So that was social demographic factors. And that was specific um, to this age group. When we looked at clinical need factors, uh, we saw there wasn't a lot, um, surprisingly. Um, first, we see intellectual disability. So if the child had an intellectual disability, and if they're over 25, we see that there's a 35% chance of getting more priority receipts. And this could reflect um, how a lot of times uh, adults, uh, when, you, when you age out of the, out of, uh, the pediatric system, uh, many receipts aren't based on an autism diagnosis, but based on an, an ID diagnosis itself. Uh, behavioral concerns didn't factor into getting priority receipts. Uh, and mental health concerns did. So uh, in the elementary school age group, um, if you had more than two mental health concerns, uh, it decreased your chance of getting uh, what you really need. And this uh, may suggest that in our mental or our, our pediatric system isn't probably isn't capable enough to, to handle um, child, uh, children with severe mental health concerns as they uh, start to come up in this uh, age group. And thirdly, looking at systemic factors. So there's a lot here um, that mattered uh, in getting priority receipts. So if they were able to afford funding, and uh, uh, sorry, if they were able to afford services, that's that first one, yes or no, if they ever received government funding. And uh, this was mostly in the younger groups. And uh, this really you know, suggests that younger families, you know, as they're starting off, that, you know, that financial question is really a, a barrier to them to receiving what they really need. Caregiver services, so across the board, this was a really strong predictor of being able to get priority services. So really emphasizing the importance of embedding uh, families, uh, family-centered care, not just the child, but families into um, uh, and getting them services and supporting them really helps the child get what they really need. Um, barriers to services played a small role uh, in the elementary school group. And um, in the older groups, getting more other receipts, um, being more embedded in the service system itself, um, allowed them to get what the other uh, top needs met as well. So overall, so we have a, sort of a, a picture of what, uh, what allows people to get what they really need. Uh, and uh, most of them 
were not sociodemographic or clinical need factors in our study. Most of them were around the systemic factors. Uh, and caregiver services really stood out as, as one that was important. So what have I told you so far? Summaries and implications. So first, we identified the top needs in a user-centric context. So asking what they really need uh, for them at this time point. The implications of some of this is it really il illustrated the complexity of navigating services uh, for individuals and their families. Secondly, we noticed that many don't get what they really want, even though they are receiving other services. And this situation was worse in the teenage years and older of the young adults and the adults. And the implication for this is there's, there really needs to be a co coordinated system reforms that allow for individual care plans, especially in those adults' years. So again, um, if you want to look at more details, um, this research study is published in open access. Feel free to look it up. Uh, we do have research summaries um, uh, for this and many of the other studies we've done uh, on our website, which I'll, sh I'll show you later. So just to check in where we are, we talked about um, what uh, service needs are, um, autism specifically, and then priority needs and receipt. And quickly, I'm going to go over um, some more recent work we're doing with the same study, uh, with the same survey, looking at the priorities of service use in children. So to start this part off, uh, we, uh, other studies, and this is one in the States, have looked at service and treatment use among children with autism spectrum disorder. And in this study, uh, in the States, they had a national sample of about 2,000 children with uh, ASD with ID, so intellectual disability, or both ASD plus ID. And what they found, the take home was that children with ASD and ID, so having an intellectual disability, they have more unmet needs, so we uh, that they indicated, they had more medication use, and they had a higher level of service use. So we asked our, our question, you know, in our study in Canada, do we see those same patterns? And um, this is looking at here the number of services um, across the age groups, and looking at the ones with ASD only in red, and ASD plus ID in gray. So just look at the ASD only, we're seeing that the services, are, uh, there's no difference between the ASD only group and the ASD ID group uh, for the element of uh, the preschool kids. Um, however, the difference occur, uh, appears and is sustained uh, once you hit five and above, where the ASD only group uh, receive less services while the ASD ID group continues to receive approximately the same amount of services across the lifespan. And when we look at clinical need, um, you don't have to go through the details, but both in terms of their physical health, their mental health, and their behavioral concerns, we see that the ASD ID group um, have more of each, and these are all significant differences um, compared to the ASD alone group. So we got us thinking, so one entry point to services um, for children is early intervention. That's one of the you know, recommendations that um, have come up in Lonnie um, was an author on this review paper, and he's spoken about this uh, at CAPC webinars, I believe. Um, and um, also there's been uh, um, sort of exposure or uh, news in the media talking about the same idea of early interventions for toddlers even earlier on. So in our study, we, we want to ask a few questions then. So in children, how does, if you've received early intervention, in the past, early intervention in the past, how does that relate to their current level of unmet need? So once you're in the system early, does that help you navigate and does that change how you currently, um, how many needs you currently have met? Secondly, you know, does having an ID make a difference? Does it differ between those with ASD only and those with ASD and ID? And thirdly, what types of service receipts, so you look at the developmental, the behavioral, or just general services, what types of service receipts, and what types of clinical needs, so physical health, behavioral, mental health, what types of service receipts and clinical need mediate that relationship between having received that early intervention in the past and the child's current level of unmet needs, so mediators of that relationship. So what we did uh, in the same survey, the CASA survey, we pulled out caregivers of children uh, who were six to 12 years old. We did two mediator analyses, so a separate analysis for ones with ASD only and ones for children who had ASD and ID. So it looked like this. So we had, uh, if they ever ac uh, accessed early intervention in the past, uh, how did that relate to the current unmet need? And looking at if certain mediators explained that relationship and there's different levels of significance, which would be uh, indicated by the asterisks. 
So service receipt, have they received this in the past? Um, and we looked at if they checked off early intervention. And then currently, uh, or recently received in the last six months, had they received any of these behavioral, developmental, or general services? And it's from that same list I showed earlier. And we created an unmet need score. So the question was, which of the following services, same list, would you like your child to have received? And seeing how many that they need, but they did not receive. So in our sample, we had ASD only and ASD plus ID. And we saw there's no, so I, you know, this is a research study, but I'm gonna gloss over some of the finer details. Um, in light gray will be the ones that we didn't see a difference. Um, so there's no difference in age. Um, we saw that there was a difference in the age of diagnosis. So when people were diagnosed with ASD, the ones with ASD plus ID were diagnosed at 4.3 uh, 4 years. Um, so we were diagnosed younger than those with ASD alone. So we saw that that was a difference that we thought was uh, important. Um, and we saw a difference in uh, their ethnicity in this uh, sample. No difference in character of education, financial difficulty. Uh, the ones with ASD plus ID, um, there's a greater percentage of them that received government funding. And this is, again, in children. Um, no difference in time in Canada. Uh, ones with ASD and ID uh, were more likely to be in uh, urban areas compared to rural areas. Uh, they also had a higher number of current services that they were receiving at three services, which was 2.7, and no difference in health status. So in our, the study variables, again, the same two groups. So uh, the percentage of people that have received early intervention more of the ones with intellectual disability and ASD uh, received early intervention compared to ASD alone. Uh, their current level of unmet needs was no different, actually. Um, there were differences in terms of the services. So again, the three groups of services, and just looking at the number of services that they're currently receiving. Um, they received, the ones with ASD ID received more be behavioral services, uh, and more developmental services, and same amount of general services. And in terms of their clinical need, um, they had more behavioral concerns, uh, no difference in mental health concerns, and physical function score. This is looking at the international classification of function, looking at their body concerns, uh, body score. Um, they had a higher number of those as well. So physical and behavioral concerns. So those were the variables. Um, so what were the actual admit needs? So here is the percentage in each group ASD and ASD and ID. So um, I'm going to, again, only show the significant differences that, and the rest is going to be uh, in light, uh, faded in background in light gray. So we saw that uh, early intervention uh, was an unmet need in the ASD only group. Um, social skills was an, uh, a significantly higher unmet need in the ASD ID group. And uh, same thing with uh, specialized summer camps and housing, the ones with ASD plus ID. Uh, found that uh, had, there's a greater proportion of them that found that that was an unmet need for them. Uh, no differences in the list of services here, uh, but in terms of community safety and life skills program uh, for these children, uh, the ones in the ASD ID group found that that was an uh, uh, unmet need more often. So in the mediation analysis, what do we see? So did accessing early intervention relate to unmet need? And we, say, we see that it did. There was quite a strong relationship if they accessed early intervention in the past that uh, there's a reduced uh, number of unmet needs they would have currently. And this was adjusted for uh, government funding and other variables here. And when we threw in those systemic and clinical mediators, we found that those mediators did explain the association between early, accessing early intervention and current unmet need. And if I break that out, what do we see? Those mediators. Um, so behavioral services, if you access early intervention in the past, um, you were more likely to receive behavioral services now. Um, and that was related to uh, having lower unmet need currently. So same thing with developmental services. Um, those were associated um, and general services. So all three types of services for the ASD only group were associated with accessing early intervention in the past which drove down their current unmet need. In terms of the clinical side, um, mental health concerns was related to accessing early intervention. It decreased the number of mental health concerns, but that was not related to unmet need. 
um, behavioral concerns did play a role. So accessing early intervention that was related, that we can't say that it caused a decrease in behavioral concerns, but it was related to it since this was a, a cross-sectional one-time study. Um, and that was, uh, again, related to having more internet need, having more behavioral concerns was related to having more internet need. Um, their physical function score was not. So in the ASD-only group, all services were related to um, having access to early intervention in the past, and that decreased around the need. Um, in and in terms of their clinical need, behavioral concerns was related to that as well. Um, in the ASD-only uh, ID group, um, we saw a completely different picture, and that's really the big take-home here. Um, accessing early intervention did not relate to the current level of unmet need, adjusting for the same factors. Um, we saw that um, it was indirectly associated with these variables, but those variables did not mediate the relationship. So really quickly, um, behavioral services, developmental services um, jet, uh, were not related to accessing early intervention. So there were indirect associations between accessing early intervention and unmet need through general services, but uh, that was an indirect association. It didn't explain the specific variance um, in this relationship between accessing early intervention and unmet need. Uh, mental health concerns, same thing. Um, nothing of behavioral concerns, and we don't see anything with physical health either. So um, that was a lot of numbers, but just to give you the take-homes, um, in the ASD-only group, having early intervention in the past, that was directly related to lower levels of current unmet need. And that was mediated um, by currently receiving more uh, services of all types and fewer behavioral concerns. The picture is very different for the ASD plus ID group. So the kids who received early intervention in the past, that you know, it didn't it didn't re directly relate to their current unmet, unmet need status, and those there were indirect associations with general services and mental health concerns. So, so very different patterns of service access and service use in these two populations of children. So um, conclusions from the second study, um, first we see that there's different service use and health patterns in children with ASD and ID. They were more likely to have received early intervention, behavioral, and developmental services. They were, however, they, at the same time, clinically, they had more behavioral concerns and more difficulty with their physical health. Um, ID status in these children with autism um, have, and uh, that led to a different pattern of service access. Um, in the ASD only group, um, in early intervention, it may not only benefit clinically, which we have seen um, from other studies, other work, but also it may help, it, may, it was related to receiving other services later on that reduced unmet need. In the ASD ID group, there's no association between these two factors, the early intervention and unmet need. And again, uh, limitations of the study, you know, this was cross-sectional, it was a correlational study, you, so we can't infer causality or directionality of uh, what we saw, but we do see these statistical relationships. And uh, this was all based on parent reports, so you know, there's caregiver interpretation of terms, so uh, when we're talking about early intervention, it's not specifically just early intensive behavioral intervention, but anything they saw as early intervention was, was um, defined that way. So the final take-homes from um, the overall presentation, um, first we looked at the conceptualization of need and the various ways to approach and to measure need. Secondly, we looked at the priority needs and receipt for people uh, with autism in Canada. Um, really address showing that there's a potential misalignment of services or that the services um, that are there aren't adequately addressing people's top needs. And that situation is shown to be worse at the older ages. Um, systemic variables were uh, most important, most, most consistently correlated with receiving your top needs. And lastly, I'm touching on navigation for families. So having an ID in addition to autism, uh, that really matters into how services are being accessed or not accessed. So thank you for your attention. Um, uh, my contact information is there, and also our uh, website for our lab, uh, ASD Mental Health, and our Twitter account. So uh, feel free to go and check out resources there as well. So I'm going to pass on the following uh, to Esther, and she'll talk about study applications and share some resources based on what we talked about. 
That's great. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Lai. I know that it's always useful for us to have not only recent um, findings, but also Canadian numbers so that we can best understand how to support our community. Um, and there's been a considerable amount of work that's been done in order to gather these findings. Um, and as Dr. Lai mentioned, Autism Seas Canada is a funder, a funding partner for the role of Dr. Weiss in his position as chair. Um, and also a key stakeholder partner as well. And what's important to us is to better understand how this type of research really impacts service delivery so that we can best support individuals with autism and their families. And so out of this, um, out of this knowledge, what I'm going to do is just highlight some key areas that stand out in terms of key implications for service um, service delivery and a lot of this won't be too surprising but perhaps there's some information here again I try to use Canadian data as much as possible to help us best understand how to support families in developing their plans of care so the first one I'm going to talk about is I'm just trying to change my slide here sorry about that um, the first one I'm going to talk about it relates to navigation and this is one um, Prior to my role with Autism Seas Canada, I was able to develop a navigation support strategy for a community uh, that now has about 800 families uh, impacted by autism. And what we found there was navigation was identified as the most useful service. Uh, however, it was the most hardest to find. And that's something that I found in this role that actually is quite common um, across the country. It's not something that's delivered um, more as a formal role. What we're finding is that people in their positions are actually doing this on the side um, uh, in addition to the role that they're providing for families. And um, what we do have in, the, in our U.S. office is actually a very formal navigation support program where families can either call in uh, with what we identify, we call it service inquiries, or they can go online virtually and navigate to find uh, services in their community. And just out of our call center, we have 14,000 calls that come in every month of families that are looking for information. And the reason why this is so important is that it's critical for communities to be able to provide uh, resources and support so that families can make educated decisions uh, on their plans of care. However, we know that it's also very difficult to find funding for services like this um, because it, it doesn't necessarily have the same outputs um, or, or is viewed as a closed program where participants can actually call when they need help and not call when they uh, don't need help and so this is an area that we're looking at in terms of how to increase this across the country. Uh, certain provinces have programs, for instance Ontario has a great program that's supported by Autism Ontario um, in different regions across the province and what we're finding is uh, either families are still unaware of navigation support when it is available to them or the actual service um, is so full because so many families are trying to access it. And at our organization alone, uh, navigation support isn't a service that we provide formally. However, I would estimate that I, uh, I end up spending about 14 to 20 hours a week um, answering service questions that come into our office. And so we know that this is a critical area that we have to take a look at uh, in terms of how to best support families. The second key area in terms of implications for this uh, that really stood out to me was in relation to the caregiver support and that being one of the key identifiers in the trajectory for the individual uh, in the family that does have an autism diagnosis. And so if you're not familiar with this recent study that came out last year from the School of Public Policy uh, from the University of Calgary, a study was done to take a look at the cost of caregiver time uh, and that was estimated to be up to $5.5 million higher for an individual with autism. Uh, than for somebody without and so there's a significant amount of a financial barrier that we already know about however one of the things that we have to be very cognizant of is that caregivers will commonly put their needs last uh, in order to ensure that the child or the individual and their family does get the support that they require and so we know that depending on the type of caregiver support that they're accessing, uh, not only are they able to be better equipped to provide service and care for their uh, family member at home, but depending on if they're also able to access peer-to-peer -peer support, um, that type of family engagement provides a level of support to families that service providers can't provide to families uh, based off of lived experience. And so what's able to happen is that they're able to become better connected not only to families, but also to the system in 
general, uh, which allows them to gain better access to services for the individual and their family that has a diagnosis, and also decrease critical things like uh, isolation, uh, increased social um, uh, surroundings as well. And so caregiver support is something that we want to ensure is provided for families right from the beginning pre-diagnosis at the sign of any developmental red flags and ensure that that continues um, across the journey. And when we're talking about caregivers, we're not only talking about parents, we're also talking about sibling support, uh, grandparent support and beyond that as well. If you haven't read this study, please um, take a look at it because it does identify some critical information. And the last key area that I want to talk about today relates to mental health. And so um, actually in Dr. Weiss's um, studies and on the website for the ASD mental health blog, we see that up to 70% of individuals with autism have at least one co-occurring mental health issue and that many times there's actually more than one in relation to that as well. And when we're taking a look at quality of life and well-being, we're identifying things that relate to um, uh, motivation to want to engage in the community, uh, transitioning through the lifespan into areas such as employment or further schooling, uh, and developing a social network, if those are things that they so desire. And when we're looking at 30% of individuals having their priority services um, unmet, that is a significant increase in terms of the risk for mental health issues. And we know that commonly across communities in Canada, there's still a large disconnect between developmental services and the mental health sector. And autism happens to fall right in the middle where there's, there can be a lot of pushback for families to be able to access the mental health services that they require. And so taking a look at how we can be more collaborative and seamless in terms of delivery for services is really important when we understand how much of an impact mental health issues are having uh, on our families that we're committed to serving as well. In terms of the next couple of slides here, um, I talked about our service inquiries that we receive at our office, and this list could go on and on and on, but I did want to provide a snapshot because likely these are similar inquiries that are also coming into your, um, into your offices as well. So looking for an assessment is a large one. Those families that are, have received a new diagnosis or on, on a path to uh, looking for an assessment um, are, are very high in terms of the calls that we get. Service navigation is number one in terms of families trying to understand what's available to them in their communities. Uh, medication is a large one, as well as family crisis um, and, and legal issues as well. Oftentimes families call in looking for some type of counseling support or where they can go to really gain support in terms of how to cope and deal with what's going on. Uh, and oftentimes families have tried a number of service organizations or other resources and feel that they have nowhere else to go in terms of accessing further support. And another key area that we look at is adult and senior uh, support as well. Um, it's interesting to take a look at the types of service inquiries that come in. What I will say is actually a, a really interesting question that I often get is, if I lived in a different province or territory, would my family member uh, have a higher quality of life because of what they would be able to access through ministry funding? And social services, education, and health are items that are delivered at a provincial level. Um, and so families often question if their life would look different depending on the on where they reside. And that's a really interesting question. And so the root of that is really understanding what are their needs um, and are they aware of what's available in the community uh, versus what they're hearing are, is offered in different communities. And so as a national organization, we're always trying to best understand what is it that provinces and territories are doing that's working and how do we promote replication of that across um, different regions. So an example I gave earlier was around the Autism Ontario's potential program which is a program that provides navigation support across the country. Uh, we're really proud that this year we've been able to fund the replication of that in Nova Scotia so that we can replicate that program and ensure that families um, in a different province can also access that support as well. 
The next couple of slides, which I'll go through quite quickly, um, are resources that may be helpful to you and your team. I know that we have so many experts and professionals on here, and so really this was uh, something um, that I wanted to share in terms of tools that I go through with families when I'm just starting out in terms of their journey into the autism world, one of them being developing their care team. And so families are often left to understand who is available to them, what are these different types of uh, professionals that um, they may interact with, uh, we know that the acronyms and all the services and therapies can be quite overwhelming, but really sitting down and having a moment with them to understand who is it that's going to be most important to have on your care team now and, and to revisit that over and over again as the uh, transition happens with their family into different types of care. The other resource that I'll discuss as well is our toolkits. And so many of you may already be, be familiar with these. Uh, we do have a variety of toolkits. Many of them have been translated into different languages, and they focus on so many different issues, all the way from the first 100 days after receiving a diagnosis to items such as um, employment, medication, getting a haircut, uh, dental visits, um, and, and other impacts uh, outside of an autism diagnosis as well. And so if you haven't been able to take a look at these, please go on our website at autismspeaks.ca. There's over 40 toolkits that have been developed. Many of them have been developed for our Autism Treatment Network, which is um, looking at developing medical guidelines and standards for care in the autism community. Uh, and there's a wealth of information. What I will say is that they have been developed in the US. And so while a lot of the information will be relevant to our Canadian community, many of the resources won't be. Um, and so that in that sense, please connect with me. I'm happy to uh, look for further information for you or take a look at any Canadian resources that have been developed in, in similar areas as well. And the last part that I wanted to go over, oh sorry, is these are some templates that have been used in terms of the toolkits. And so what we try to do in developing these toolkits is make them really re useful um, from a practical sense for families. And so the 100-day toolkit will have weekly breakdowns in terms of plans. There's lots of charts and um, templates that families can use to help them in terms of keeping track and understanding um, uh, all the people that they're connecting with in one place. Uh, an item that I often hand out to families uh, that I find useful and I get a lot of great feedback around is the Autism Physician Handbook. And this is a, a guidebook that was developed uh, for, with Autism Canada and it was to support physicians in making, um, becoming more aware about autism spectrum disorder and also also become more confident in making um, a diagnosis and it's very visually appealing it's um, a lot of picture based and what I have families do either before they have received a diagnosis when they're going in to see a physician or even afterwards with any service professional that they're going to interact with is go through and just circle the ones that are applicable for their child it really helps to give a sense in terms of that connection and understanding the child and it helps a lot of the uh, conversation and description that um, can oftentimes be hard for parents to communicate by really being able to go through and um, connect to what autism looks like for their family member. I realize that we're running out of time and so very quickly what I do want to do is go over um, something that I want to ensure that all of you are familiar with and this is an opportunity for you to be able to expand um, programs and services that you're providing uh, for families in your community. Sorry about that, I think I just skipped a slide, but this is actually our Family Services Community Grants Program. And so if you're not familiar with it, we are a funding agency and we provide services, uh, sorry, funding for service organizations to increase their programs. Um, and right now it's open. And so taking a look at all the information that we've gone through through these reports, it's important for us to be able to support you to increase uh, what it is that you're doing and the wonderful work that you're providing for families. I'll skip through these slides. You have them available and it's also um, available on our website. But the one thing that I do want to highlight is that they are collaborative grants. And so uh, we are enforcing collaboration across our community. So you will have to partner with a minimum of one other organization um, to be able to apply for a grant. They're currently open right now and what we're funding right now are two different streams up to $40,000 each. And the first stream is um, an innovation grant which is new programs that you want to give a try. This is typically the hardest to find funding for because there isn't evidence or impact that's been demonstrated yet. But if you have an idea that you feel would work, we do want to be supporting that. And the other piece 
is relation is related to the replication grant. If you have a program that you know about that you want to adopt in your community, or you have an existing program that you want to expand, whether it be by age, uh, by group, or by geographical location, we also want to be supporting that as well. And please don't be too alarmed that the letter of intent is due this Friday. It really is three easy questions to ensure that our funding program is the right program for you to be applying to. We don't want to waste your time. Uh, and then the full application isn't due until later on. Uh, so please go onto our website. All the information is there. But I did want to make sure that you knew what that opportunity is that was available to you to increase your services as well. And with that, I will say thank you and pass that back to, I guess, Doug. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lai and Esther. Uh, great presentation. Lots of content, lots of data from uh, from Jonathan, lots of resources from Esther. So really, really quite interesting. Um, maybe we'll, we don't have much time for questions. Maybe if people are able to stay, we'll, we'll take an extra five minutes if there are any questions. But first, I, I'd like to hand it over to, to uh, Dr. Gail Andrew just to see if you had any, any thoughts about some of the, the interesting research that we, uh, that we saw from Dr. Lai. Oh, thanks. So that was a fantastic presentation, and it really puts data forward of what we see in, in our clinical world. This is what the caregivers are telling us. Oh, you have given us the hard data that we can do more advocacy to get the right resources that are evidence-based for our families. And it really, the work that we're doing with our TAPC community, particularly with the Canadian Network of Child Youth Rehabilitation, um, autism is one of our priorities. We have a the PERS Pediatric Rehabilitation Reporting System database that's capturing some of this data from our member organizations. Uh, the other TAFC work that really resonates with this is the work we've done on transitions, the Canadian Guidelines for Transition. And transition is probably that biggest gap, and you've really illustrated that in your data as well, that we have to really have a better transition pathway into the adult system of care and then do provide training for adult service providers that are, are ASD informed and the whole concept of supporting our caregivers. Uh, I was involved in another study uh, looking at caregiver stress, just using a stress index and that, what your site actually captures that as well. So thank you for the data and I'm sure it's going to stimulate a, a lot of our TAFC members to think about what we're doing within our own organizations and with our within our own different provinces. I know in Al I'm from Alberta at the Glen Rose Rehabilitational Hospital where we have uh, a, a major um, autism clinical and research center. But we've been able to convince the province that navigation is one of our key areas that we need to focus more of our work. So thanks for more data. Thanks All for right. comments, Gail. Um, yeah, go ahead, Doug. I, I was just going to ask a question. Uh, I, I, I wasn't, I'm not sure if your study was designed to uh, to do this, but I was wondering if you were able to identify any sort of regions or even provinces that had that were able to address unmet needs in a in a in a better way, like as far as had had fewer unmet needs versus others. Was there any sort of uh, pattern as far as provincial provincially or regionally? So yes, so the survey was across Canada. Um, I haven't looked, like, sort of mined the data to look specifically at provincial differences. In the report, we they did break it down into different provinces um, and what people need. But we like to actually look at sort of the predictors and really do a thorough analysis. That is something you know I think would be worth doing because um, each province you know has unique ways of of, of handling um, service needs. So that would be something interesting um, to look at for sure. Uh, Esther, uh, there was a question that came in asking if uh, the funding that you were mentioning is, is that, and I'm assuming it is, I'm assuming it is, but is it accessible by organizations from any province? It is. It's a national funding program, which is a great question. Uh, what I will clarify, though, is that the lead organization that does apply does need to have charitable status. However, any of the partners that they collaborate with can, uh, do not have to. So that can be, uh, whether that be a professional individual uh, or a corporate organization, we do not want to eliminate anybody who wants to get involved in supporting the autism community. Uh, but based on CRA guidelines, we do require the lead organization to have charitable status. All right, Gail. Any any uh, final thoughts from uh, you before we wrap up? We are at, as at the at the last minute of the extra five that I thought we could allocate to questions here. Uh, just the importance of 
both working nationally but also working locally in your own community. Uh, I love Esther's diagram with the family at the center and all the other bubbles around. I, I feel I have a responsibility to know what all those bubbles are, the resources in my local community for my families after, uh, to help connect them with those services after diagnoses uh, and, and to have an updated repository and you know, having a repository of services on, available online to families who can navigate the system by themselves. But I, I find it, it, it's really that over time, because things change, professionals change, and the new professional in that position may not be autism informed in their service delivery. So I think working locally as well as working broadly with the great work that Esther is doing. All right. And I think we will try and wrap this up uh, now. And we'll just hand it over to uh, Esther and uh, Dr. Lai for any sort of closing sort of key messages you'd like to leave the audience with. Uh, Esther, we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks for that. One of the things that I will mention, um, and I'll come out with more information later on, is we're actually uh, very fortunate that we've been able to receive funding to build a national database uh, very similar to what we have in the U.S. And so the the vision behind that is that we can have families put in their postal code and populate services in their community, not just related to uh, autism-specific services, but even things like an autism-friendly dentist or hair cutters or anything like that. And so in the upcoming months I will engage um, not only with CAFC but uh, likely many of the organizations that are on this call to take a look at ensuring that your services are represented on this database portal um, and then also to gain resources that you're aware about in your communities. We do want to make this a very collaborative effort um, to provide. I know that a lot of regions across Canada have this but uh, in terms of a national um, stamp on it we do want to be working together with communities and not uh, a duplicating work that's already been done. So that is something that I'm excited to announce that we will have in Canada uh, that it will be maintained on an ongoing basis as well. So stay tuned for further information on that. All right. And Dr. Lai, anything, any sort of closing messages you, you would like to leave the audience with? Yeah, I can sort of say three things um, really quickly. So I think first, um, you know, this data, it, it, it allows, I think it allows for clinicians and uh, other advocates to really you know, have a handle and, and really, you know, puts puts something solid that they can have in their hand as they advocate and as they kind of, you know, work on the front lines. And we have a lot of resources online um, on our website uh, for, for you to download some lay summaries and such. And yet, yeah, to secondly, to reflect, Gail, uh, reflect on what Gail is saying, I think the tr transition and the caregiver stress and a lot of these things are, are things we are finding with uh, surveys as we continue to do a longitudinal look following up on this sample and, and seeing some of the differences that are changing over time, how people are using services as they go across transition ages, um, what that looks like. And thirdly, I think um, reflecting uh, what Esther was just saying, um, that you know, it, this is really a team effort and, you know, working together, I think um, I got to uh, thank again uh, Jonathan Weiss, my supervisor, um, of being able to work with him and doing this and other people who, uh, nameless amount of people who have put a lot of effort into uh, working on the survey uh, to make it what it is and to be able to find these resources. So, yeah, that, that's what I'm close with. All right. Well, thank you very much to all of you for uh, the presentation today. And, and it would have been great to have a little bit longer uh, discussion and conversation, but there's just so much interest in the topic, so much data, as Gail uh, mentioned. Uh, it was really great to put some data behind some of the conversations that many of us have had over the last number of years around uh, services and lack of services in some cases. So uh, really appreciate the presentation. Uh, we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and it's great when you can watch live, as we do often have a great discussion. Uh, but when you can't watch live, uh, the re we do record these sessions and make them available after the fact on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network at www.can.cafc.org. Next week, we're going to be welcoming back Dr. Stan Kucher from Dalhousie University and the IWK Health Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia, to talk about pathways through mental health care, the complete and comprehensive school approach. Uh, the pathway through care model presents an evidence-based method for identifying youth who need mental health services while not creating demand for youth who do not need it by helping increase the mental health literacy and help-seeking ability of teenagers and their teachers, as well as linking health care systems and schools. Uh, then 
following that on June 21st, we will be welcoming Sherry Stewart back to our, our podium to talk about personality and risk for substance abuse, background, content, and evidence base for the prevention program for adolescent substance abuse prevention. Uh, Dr. Stewart will introduce uh, the background theory and research that stimulated the development of the prevention program and will provide an overview of the content and structure of the intervention. And she will also uh, review the established evidence base for the program and plans and their plans for next steps in, in uh, the prevention Preventure Research Program. So, some uh, great stuff coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks again to uh, Dr. Lai, uh, Esther Ree, and uh, Dr. Gail Andrew for joining us on the panel today, and we hope to see everyone back here next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>